morning, everybody. Let's all stand before we sing our first song. And I'm going to read from Psalm 33. This is one of my favorite psalms. It says, Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-string lyre. Uh, Larry, you know how to play a ten-string lyre? Six strings hard enough? I agree. <laughs> Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for the Lord. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. To help me with my daily Bible reading, I have a Bible app. Um, and I, what is it called? I don't even remember what it's called. It's Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway. And it has daily verses. So that helps me to get into the word uh, every morning. The first thing I, I do once I get up and turn my phone on is I go to the Bible Gateway. It just helps me get centered. And that was one of the verses was, was, uh, was in 33 of Psalm. So that helps me out. So that's just a little tip in case you need some help with that. I definitely do need help with that. This first song is called The Way. Through every battle Pastor Lewis Lee. Welcome to the Chinese Community Church Sunday worship service. Let's just begin with a word of prayer. Let's remain standing for prayer. Okay. Let's pray. 
Father God, thanks for another beautiful day and the opportunity to gather for worship, both those here in person as well as those joining online later. And Father, we pray that, again, our hearts would be open to you, that uh, regardless of whether we've been worshiping for decades or worshiping just a matter of weeks or maybe even a first-time guest, that, Father, all of us would be open uh, to the touch of your presence, your love, your holiness, your mercy and grace, especially as we prepare for communion today, where we remember in a very powerful and significant way all that Jesus has done for us. And so, Father, we commit ourselves to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. <coughs> if you haven't already done so, could you please silence your cell phones? We would appreciate that. And uh, really appreciate those who've already responded since the announcement last, last week that uh, our church, CCC, is, is partnering with uh, New Hope in um, collecting used shoes. Now, again, no holes in them, uh, but all these shoes will be uh, donated to a Christian ministry called Souls for Christ, S-O-L-E-S, -E kind of a takeoff on, you know, the obviously soul, S-O-U-L. But all these will go to needy folks in Africa, and uh, New Hope has set a goal for themselves to, to um, uh, try to collect at least a 1,000 pairs of uh, shoes and I think they're around 500 or so, five or 600, and I was talking to Pastor Daniel a while back, and I said, you know, I think our church could come up with at least 100, and I think we're almost halfway to that goal, so, um, you know, keep bringing those shoes, and we're, we'll be collecting them all this month, so this is actually the first week in February, but, uh, so you got another two or three weeks, so please remember to make a note of that. Just bring them here on, to church on Sunday mornings, drop them off in the uh, front lobby there, and I'll make sure they get over to New Hope. Uh, let me just mention the men's Bible study group is uh, probably going to wrap up our current study in a few more weeks. And our next study is this book called Life Lessons from Revelation by Max Lucado. Now, if, uh, Max, if you've heard of Max Lucado, he's a very well-known author and speaker. Uh, actually, I think uh, he's, um, he's got over 140 million books in print. But um, if you've ever been curious about the book of Revelation, this book is going to help all of us to understand it uh, much more clearly and to see the life applications and life lessons from the book of Revelation. So I have a number of these copies um, available. The retail for $13, but they're available to you for just $7. Uh, so if you, even if you haven't been a part of the men's group in a while and you're interested in maybe thinking about uh, you know, c connecting again, please pick one up for me as soon as possible. Uh, we'll be starting this next month sometime, uh, but to see me after the service, okay? All right, and just as I mentioned, uh, we will be taking communion later during the service. So, Dan. Thanks, Pastor. So I'll stand. We've seen 10,000 reasons, 10,000 reasons. <laughs> Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Never before, oh my soul, I'll worship. 
sermon, pastor actually quoted part of uh, the chorus of this song, Who Am I? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are, referring to Jesus. This is called Who Am I? of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind till you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours. Who am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love? Watch me rise again. Who am I that the voice that calmed the sea would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. Tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind. Still, you hear me when I'm calling, or you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am
opportunity to gather, Lord, in your house to, to praise you, to worship you, to, to hear you, Lord, to hear you speak to us into our hearts through Pastor Lewis, Lord. We pray that our ears and our eyes and our hearts are open for that message, Lord. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Lord, have a seat. Can we have the scripture reader come up? morning. Uh, before I read the scripture, I'd like to share something with you. Uh, I haven't been able to be, be here personally for the last several weeks because I uh, contracted COVID. Uh, actually, my daughter Angela and I had both contracted COVID. I blame her because she gave it to me. <laughs> but uh, by God's grace, you know, we both had not only the initial vaccines, but the booster as well. And uh, Again, by God's grace, our symptoms were very mild and very manageable. So praise God for that. Okay. Today's scripture reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 25. Hear the word of God. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Really appreciate all those who have continued to serve uh, in various capacities, especially during COVID the last several years, but especially uh, our greeters on Sunday morning, those who do scripture reading, and of course our worship team uh, every Sunday morning just really appreciate their ministry, which blesses all of us. There are many things in the Christian life, uh, in our church life together, that sometimes we uh, take for granted, and uh, sometimes, you know, we 
even have difficulty explaining why we do certain things. Uh, here at uh, Chinese Community Church, we take communion the first Sunday of each month. And uh, for those who've been attending for a long time, this church or any, any Christian church, uh, uh, you know, it, the practice of taking communion is something that's become sort of, you know, we just almost do it without even thinking. And if we had to explain to someone, you know, what, why do you take communion? What is it, what's that all about? You say, well, you know, we hear 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verses 23 and on, so uh, quite often. But then I, I'm sort of trying to package it a little bit, and I, I'll give, I'll share three reasons why uh, Jesus Christ left this particular practice for his followers, which has been practiced faithfully for the last several thousand years. Let me just uh, mention last Sunday at the closing song of the worship service uh, was a song, I think it was, it's called How Great Thou Art. It was a hymn that was written in the late 1800s. And um, it brought back a lot of fond memories for me personally because I became a Christian when I was 12 years old. So that's 55 years ago. And uh, back in 1966, uh, I've shared my testimony before by the grace of God. Um, ended up going to this Christian summer camp, even though I'm from a non-Christian family, because my mother just happened to meet the director of this camp in a store somewhere randomly, and uh, found out that she, she was willing to pay any amount of money to send my brother and myself away from home for a week. It could have been a cult, it could have been any kind of weird religion. She didn't care. Uh, she just thought, wow, where do I sign up? Because uh, to get her two boys out of the house, you know, for this particular summer of 1966, uh, she couldn't be more thrilled. But it just happened to be a Christian evangelical summer camp in Michigan near Grand Rapids. And I remember that was one of the first Christian songs I ever learned, How Great Thou Art. And so every time I hear it, it kind of brings back those memories. It was the first time I experienced God's unconditional love and grace. Uh, through the good news, just trusting in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If you've attended any of the memorial services that I've had the privilege of helping with over the years, uh, you know that um, my particular uh, practice as a minister, even though I know some ministers feel like, <clears throat> excuse me, some ministers feel like, you know, they, they want to give a pretty much a sermon uh, during those services, I've always felt that if people wanted to hear a sermon, they would come to church. But at those memorial services, we really try to focus on the sharing of um, fond memories by family and close friends. And uh, that's always been sort of the, the heart of the services that I've helped to lead. Because, uh, you know, I just feel that, uh, you know, that's, that's the primary purpose of a, of a memorial service. Again, I do share the gospel. I mean, I, I talk for maybe three or four minutes in the beginning but I do share the gospel because a lot of the folks who attend are not necessarily believers or church individuals. But I just want to mention to you that, um, it, you know, obviously it's important to have the sharing of fond memories, uh, especially when you've lost a loved one. This church family, over the last several years with COVID, has lost a, couple of, uh, a number of dear brothers and sisters. Um, there are at least six individuals that I can think of that I've been, you know, sort of keeping track of the last several years, these are very faithful, these were faithful members of the church who attended almost every single Sunday. Uh, but I've talked to the leaders about having a special um, service, possibly even as early as next month, not qu quite sure. It'll probably be on our first Sunday of a month coming up soon. But it's, it's uh, the theme of that day will be, you know, gone but not forgotten. Uh, these brothers and sisters, uh, who've gone home to be with the Lord uh, during COVID. Uh, I'll just mention their names, Hazel Fong, George Fong, Joe and Mary Jane Yi, uh, Martin Everett, and Mike Toda. And so as I'm making plans for that special service, it'll be on Sunday morning, it'll be a Sunday worship service. Uh, if you would like to share um, a personal fond memory that you would uh, you know, like to share with the church family, please let me know uh, as soon as possible, and because I'll be putting that together. And as I mentioned, it, it could happen even the first Sunday next month in March, uh, maybe later, but uh, let me know, okay? And my email, again, is in the, on the bulletins on the back, and it's kind of small print there, but it's asianpk at aol.com. 
All of us uh, have had unique, personal, positive memories of loved ones who have uh, passed away and gone home to be with the Lord if they had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But all of us can share uh, in the initial experience of God's love through our faith in Jesus Christ. And that special memory is uh, something that ties us all together as believers. And that's really what communion is all about. And so I'll just give you, you know, in your outline there, if you have the bulletin, you see the outline, pretty simple. But three key words, commemoration, proclamation, and examination. And so we'll take a little look at each of those in more detail. But let's just begin with a word of prayer. Okay, let's pray together. Let's pray. Father God, thanks so much for the time of worship, for our brothers and sisters who led us into your presence. Thank you especially for communion that we will partake in uh, in just a few moments. But Father, I pray that you'll help us to have hearts and minds and spirits that are open to you, to your word, and to your spirit. Just refresh within each of us a sense of your presence and your love and your grace and your mercy and your holiness. And just remind us of what an amazing privilege it is to know the creator God of the universe through simple faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we commit this service and this message now to you in Jesus' name. Amen. The first point in the outline, commemoration. We remember Jesus, Jesus and his death for us. This is found in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verses 23 to 25. If we could bring up those verses, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 25. <clears throat> okay. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you, do this in remembrance of me. In the verse 25, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. God has always been seeking to help his people remember him and his many powerful acts of love and deliverance on behalf of his people for his own glory. You think of the Old Testament, Passover, when God brought his people out of slavery in Egypt, he had them practice, he had them uh, do something that was, it, really, if, if we understand what was going on here, uh, it, it's, it really is incredible, because the idea of every family, every household, slaying a lamb and spreading the blood on the threshold of their doors, I mean, it's, it's just absolutely incredible. You think, you know, why would God have his people do this? Um, it's pretty gruesome. I mean, can you imagine if God wanted all of us, instead of taking these nice little cups of uh, juice and things like that, to, to actually physically kill a, a sacrificial lamb and to spread its blood on our, you know, the threshold of our door, just to remind them, because the angel of death was coming through that night, and the firstborn of all Egypt, not only uh, of, of humans, but every firstborn of all the animals would, be, would die. <clears throat> and I, I know for some you think, wow, you know, what kind of God is that? Is this, but, but God wants his people to understand, you know, that uh, he is an all-consuming, infinitely holy and righteous God. Yes, he's infinitely loving and gracious and merciful, but sin has consequences. And from the very beginning with Adam and Eve, when they disobeyed God in the Garden of Eden, Remember when they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves and then God comes along and, and provides um, the garments made really from, from fur. So some animals had to die uh, for God to provide this covering. And that covering would be a symbol to the eventual covering of the blood of Jesus Christ that would cover all of our sins. But throughout the Old Testament, God had his people remember, remember, remember about how much he loves us and his grace and mercy, but also at the same time, 
the incredible, uh, just har it's hard to, to humanly fathom and understand the magnitude of the cost. <clears throat> Innocent blood had to be shed. And so all these thousands and pr probably millions of animals had died in the Old Testament, they were all looking forward. They were, they were a symbol looking forward to the cross. Now, once Jesus came and died on the cross, he was the Lamb of God. He was the ultimate sacrifice who paid the penalty for all of our sin. Now, after the cross, the church, the believers in Christ, those of us who are here today, when we partake of that little cup of juice, we're looking back to the cross. So all those animal sacrifices for thousands of years looked forward to the cross. All these thousands of years, uh, we look back to the cross. The cross becomes central and becomes preeminent that, you know, that's the, all of human history, all of our existence of the universe, it all points to the cross. Why? Because God wanted to glorify himself and to, to, to magnify both his holiness as well as his love and grace. Both. They go hand in hand. It's not just one or the other. It's not just, you know, fire and brimstone sermons about God's holiness and wrath and, you know, we're all hopeless sinners. And, and it's like, wow, you know, where's the mercy and the tenderness and the love and the grace of God? But they have to go hand in hand. Actually, we cannot ap really appreciate the, how much God loves us, and we can't appreciate the, the depth of his grace and his mercy and, unless we have some grasp of his holiness, because we have to understand, you know, how far we fall short and what we're all deserving of, an eternal separation from God in a place of wrath. But God in his mercy and his grace has made known to us the way, the truth, and the life through the sacrifice of his son. Now, I've mentioned this before in past sermons, but, you know, I personally, I don't have a great memory. I'm, I've not been blessed like some of you with having a very good memory. So it's always been a struggle in school and things. That's why I'm always amazed at those of you who can remember so many things. I got this brother-in-law who's got this uh, amazing memory that God's blessed him with, where uh, if you tell him a phone number, he doesn't have to write it down. I look at him and I say, I can barely remember my own phone number, you know. <laughs> and, and yet, he's proven again and again. I'm looking at him thinking, you better write that down. No, no he's got it, and he, he's got it. He's got that kind of memory. And some of you are blessed that way. But you know what? When it comes to spiritual things, all of us, regardless of how great your memory is or how great your IQ is or how much education you have, whatever, all of us, every single one of us as human beings has spiritual amnesia. We forget very quickly. All of us. We all have this tendency. Now think about it. When's the last time we experienced some amazing blessing from God? You know, whatever it might have been. How long did it take before something happened that was a little more negative, more of a problem? And suddenly, you know, that wonderful praise and worship for God and God, we're so great and we're so thankful and it just, boom, it's gone. Now we're just focused on this problem. It's like, you know, we start grumbling and, you know, it's like, where are you, God? And, you know, hey, I'm, I'm not here to criticize. Them. I'm looking in the mirror. I mean, I'm, I'm that way myself. I don't know how many times on a Sunday morning there was this amazing worship and fellowship and I'm just feeling so close to God and driving home later that day, within 60 minutes, something happens. And like, well, you know, what happened to my intimacy with God and God's greatness? Uh, somebody cut me off, you know, and whatever. It's like, ah. Oh. So it's like, we're, that's part of human nature. And God knows it. And God is very gracious and merciful to us. And people have been like that for thousands of years. And so that's why, you know, in the Old Testament, God is continually repeating to his people, remember, remember, remember. And here are some tangible things for you to remember. Do Passover every year, and do animal sacrifices are going on, you know, just on a very regular basis, not just once a year. But uh, so it's happening all the time because we tend to forget. We gather for worship on Sunday mornings. And... Uh, you know, and I, I appreciate hearing folks say, yeah, it's really helpful because it kind of helps me to refocus my life after a busy week of work, whatever's going on, you know, family at home and, you know, other things and finances and all kinds of stuff. It's like, hey, it's a chance to refocus. 
But we take communion, you know, once a month. That's our practice. But, uh, you know, in the early church, in the book of Acts, when you read it, you find out, we find out that the Christians were taking communion every day. <laughs> you, know, you think, well, we don't even gather every day. But, you know, that's, that was a practice early on. And you saw the, the, the results. They had this spiritual power. Uh, and God was moving and working in, a, in a, just an amazing way. But they were remembering the Lord's death every single day as they were worshiping and fellowshipping together. Now, I'm not suggesting that, you know, that's necessarily what we have to do today, but we, we need to be very uh, focused. And, you know, I've shared this uh, a number of times since we reopened this past August. But churches around the world, because of COVID, really struggling with this whole issue of people coming back to gather for worship in person. Now, obviously, that's not uh, something that's safe for every individual to do, and I've tried to make it as clear as possible. We're not trying to put a guilt trip on everybody, say, well, everybody should be back here in person. No, of course not. We need to be responsible and be good stewards of what God has given to each of us, and each of us has different circumstances. But there are a whole lot of us you know, part of our church family so here at CCC, something during my 10 years when I was the full-time pastor here, I, I, would, I would say, you know, this, this church has been really amazing in a lot of ways, but there, there's a couple little things here that could, could use some work. And one of them is, you know, this whole issue of folks, uh, and I don't know how many times I'd be in some store, you know, just walking around Sacramento somewhere, and somebody would, would say, hey, Pastor Lewis, and I'd be looking at him like, you look vaguely familiar. But, you know, you, you want to be polite with people, and, and so I tried to make some conversations, and then it would click, okay, I, I see this person maybe once or twice a year, you know, Christmas Sunday, Easter Sunday. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, every church has uh, folks that they call, you know, they're kind of on the fringe. They sort of attend sporadically. Um, but Chinese Community Church, um, for whatever reason, maybe because it's been around for 95 years or whatever, I think there are, is a, there's a huge number of people out there who, if they were asked, what, what's your church or what's your home, they would say Chinese Community Church. And if every single one of them showed up on the, on the same Sunday, we, we would probably have at least three to 500 people. I, I kid you not. If, if, if everybody showed up on the same Sunday. Now, again, I'm not here to, again, just put guilt on people or whatever, but I'm, I'm here to encourage and to urge everyone to take this seriously, to understand that when we remember the Lord through communion, it's a very special time to gather uh, as brothers and sisters in Christ and to have this common denominator that draws us all together, that regardless of all the other human differences, whether it be race or gender or age or socioeconomic status, all those human differences sort of fade into the background because now what becomes central is the cross, that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. And, uh, yeah, I know that people, you know, during COVID and doing the online thing, and, again, I'm so thankful for Ted and Dan and others who've made all of this possible online. But there are some uh, who really kind of just need a little more encouragement to come on back. And, you know, we take precautions here. Everyone's wearing a mask in here except for me up here at the pulpit. There's nobody within 10 feet of me. So, uh, you know, we're taking precautions, but there's something that, uh, there's a spiritual dynamic that cannot be replaced uh, no matter what technology we have. You have to be here in person. And I would hope to, say to those who have been able to, to gather back in person, that they would stand up here if they had the opportunity to say, yeah, that's right, amen. You know, and I see some heads nodding right now even. It's because, you know, there's something. When Jesus said two or three are gathered in my name, there I will be also. That wasn't, and to some extent that's true when you communicate with somebody by phone or email or, you know, whatever. But the spiritual dynamic can only happen when you're physically together. Physically together. I honestly believe that, that 100 years from now, no matter what kind of technology they got, you know, holographic things and 3D and everything, you know, it'll be just like you're there. Uh, it won't be exactly the same. And so please, pray about this. Will you take it to heart? Not just Communion Sunday, but every Sunday that we gather for worship, there's, uh, as I've said before, when you're not here, 
uh, it's not just you missing out. It's all of us. It's the body of Christ that is missing out. And certainly God um, is, is more pleased and honored uh, by us taking this kind of focus and this priority. Now, for some, they have to reschedule things and, you know, that's maybe go to bed a little earlier on Saturday nights, whatever. But um, it would be great to just see uh, more of our extended church family gather for worship as much as possible in person. Okay, that was a lot on point one. Um, point two, besides commemoration, we remember the Jesus and his death for us, is proclamation. Let's look at verse 26 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Do we understand and realize that every time we participate in communion, we are helping to proclaim the truth of the gospel? And it's very interesting, isn't it, the phrase, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, meaning he's coming back. And so from the cross is when he first came, that was his first advent, you know, Jesus, the word, the living word, the infinite word, the living word, he became flesh and he dwelt among us. He was crucified, he was resurrected, returned to the right hand of God the Father. But he's coming back someday. Physically, he's coming back to earth. Now, there's some debate among evangelical Christians even about how, you know, when that's going to happen, how it's going to happen. But, but they all agree he's coming back, the second coming. And so when we take communion, we proclaim, we're looking back to the cross, but we're also looking ahead to when he comes back. So in between, whether it's a couple thousand years or it's going to be another 10,000 years, we don't know. That's in God's own program. But we are to be faithful, and we are to live our lives in anticipation that it could be today. It could be today. And if he comes back today, what, you know, what, what's going on in our own personal relationship with him? Now, again, this is not meant as a guilt trip. It's meant as, an, as leading to the third point, really, which is, it's a time of examination. It's a commemoration, it's a proclamation, but it's also a per time of personal examination. Uh, let me just mention also that, uh, you know, when we proclaim the gospel, we are proclaiming the gospel in word and deed. Both. It's not an either or, but both in what we say, but as well as how we live. And people around us, whether it be our neighbors, coworkers, you know, extended family, whatever, complete strangers, what do they see in us? Not just Sunday mornings when we're gathered for church and worship, but all through the week, 24-7. And this is, uh, you know, shared, this concept is shared a number of times in Scripture, but the Apostle Paul certainly shared it uh, himself a number of times. Because, um, you know, it, it, he wanted to make it clear it wasn't just his preaching, uh, it wasn't just the things he said, but it's how he lived his life. And it kind of amplifies or just exemplifies Acts 1.8. Acts 1.8 is a verse, we don't need to turn there, but it's, an act, it's a verse that many of you are familiar with. Remember when um, Jesus ascended back into heaven and uh, he sent the Holy Spirit to, so that every follower of Christ would have the Spirit of God dwelling within us. And he said, you'll be my witnesses. You'll be my witnesses. He did, and, and the King James Version says, witnesses unto me. Uh, the newer translations, which I think are more accurate to the original manuscripts, my witnesses. Now you say, what's the difference? To be a witness unto someone simply means we tell people about that person. Okay, And you can do that whether you have a relationship with them or not. But this, when Jesus says, you're my witnesses, he's talking about a relationship, and he's talking about the fact that you know, we are his witnesses 24-7 because we belong to him. We are identified with him. So even if nothing's coming out of our mouths, what's coming out of our lives reflects on Jesus because we are his witnesses. Now, sometimes we're not really that great of witnesses in a positive way. Other times we're a much better witness. So, you know, we have our ups and downs. Nobody's perfect. But the key is, am I becoming a more consistent, positive witness 
for Jesus Christ. Not just in what I say, but how I treat people, how I react to people, my priorities and values. These are all part of living the Christian life. We are his witnesses. Now, the third point, again, is examination. And if you haven't filled in the blanks yet, you know, again, remember, we, we remember Jesus and his death for us. We proclaim the gospel. And now, the third point, we examine our spiritual condition. We examine our spiritual condition. Now, actually, in 1 Corinthians 11, the context of this passage that we're looking at, if you look, if you can possibly bring up verses 20 to 22, Go back a few verses if possible. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20 to 22. The context is, is the Apostle Paul is actually exhorting these Christians uh, at Corinth because, thanks, uh, I appreciate that, Jonathan. It says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead. And let's go to the next screen if possible yeah through, through 22 for as you eat each of you goes ahead um, oh yeah great yeah each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else one remains hungry another gets drunk verse 22 don't you have homes to eat and drink in or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing Okay, that's good right there. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, that was not in the notes, okay, so uh, appreciate you coming up with that. So what, what was happening was the early church in Corinth, some Christians were, were more wealthy and others, you know, were more destitute, and the wealthier ones were kind of having these special little gatherings, these love feasts uh, that they associated with communion, and they were having all their great food and even getting drunk, and they had no concern whatsoever about sharing with the other Christians. This is within the same church, uh, and they were going hungry. And, you know, you say, well, how could you have that kind of insensitivity and self-centeredness and disparity within the same body of believers? It was happening in Corinth, and they had a bunch of other spiritual problems as well. But, you know, that's something that I, I thank God, you know, that uh, there are a lot of wonderful things here at CCC, and, that, and this is certainly one of them, is that that kind of problem would never happen here. Quite frankly, you know, I mean, I don't know what went on before I, I came in 2009, but it, when I, ever since I came here, what I saw was a church family where the brothers and sisters in Christ, regardless of all of the other differences, uh, you know, and uh, how blessed they were or how destitute, whatever, there was a sharing. There was a consideration for one another. And, you know, ever since I've been here, I, I know that whenever there was anything the church folks were doing together, especially anything officially as a church fellowship or, you know, gathering for dinner, whatever, there was always the sensitivity about someone who may not be able to afford it. And we always made sure that that never hindered anyone from participating. And the generosity that's taken place here so that there would always be the sensitivity that, you know, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're a family of God here. There's no hierarchy, you know, depending on all of the other stuff that goes on in our human lives. It's just, it, it just sort of disappears. And that's something that really is uh, to be commended, something that should exist in every single local church. It's like a family. And you, when you gather for your family gatherings, you know, like for the holidays or whatever, you know, there's no sense of who gets a better seat, you know, because uh, they're doing better than another sibling. Of course not. And in the family of God, that's the kind of unity and harmony that should exist. But in Corinth, unfortunately, it was not. And so the Apostle Paul was kind of exhorting them. And uh, now he's saying in verses 27 and 28, uh, let's go yeah, back to, thank you. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now, so there's a broader context of, so for all Christians today, you know, that we, we pause and we just kind of do a little spiritual inventory. You know, what, what's going on in my own attitudes and my own um, actions and priorities and values in my Christian life? How, how much am I walking and, and, and uh living my Christian life in a manner which honors and glorifies God. Are there some things that are kind of out of sync with that goal, with that focus? 
And that's going to be true for all of us. And some may say it might be something small, it may be something bigger, you know, whatever. But we need to, de- to deal with that personally. And it's a, pause, it's a time, an opportunity to just pause and reflect a little bit. And to remember, Jesus died for my sin. Is there some unconfessed sin in my life? A sin of commission, something I know I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing, or something I know I should be doing that I'm not doing, a sin of omission. They're both sin. They both fall short of the glory of God, of this new life that God wants us to live out, that he made possible through the death of his son. So all of us have something like that. So it's a time to personally reflect on it. And to take of the elements, the bread and the cup, in what's called a worthy manner. A worthy manner. A worthy manner that reflects the, of what, it, what they represent. They represent the body and blood of Jesus. You know, and I, I think, uh, you know, all of us, if we're honest, we've got to admit, there have been, there's been at least one communion in our lifetime where we just maybe, you know, we're just doing it kind of flippantly. You know, just, just going through the motions, okay, you know, just part of the service, I'll just get, get this done with. All of us have done that. But let's get back to the real, original purpose and intent. Why did Jesus give us this particular practice? He wants us to remember him in a very significant way and in a way that would cause us to confess any unconfessed sin, but also to just be able to experience that renewed sense of fellowship and closeness and intimacy with the living God. James chapter 1, we don't need to turn there, but James chapter 1, uh, verses 22 to 25, remember it talks about how the word of God, the written word of God, the scriptures is like a mirror. And it says, you know, when a person looks in the mirror (laughs) and sees things that need to be adjusted, they need to adjust them, you know, and if they just turn away again, it's kind of like the person who looks at the word of God or hears the word of God sees, should see the area of sin or shortcoming, you know, whether it's an attitude or an action or behavior or the way we treat people, whatever, and we see it, we see it clear like a mirror, and we just turn away. And, you know, it's like, I think we all understand that before we go to an important meeting or gathering somewhere, you know, we're going to look at a mirror because if there's some kind of food stain on, on, on the side of your face or something, I mean, you don't want to go to that meeting. Uh, there was a, a meeting I had an opportunity of attending a number of years ago. Actually, it was right after 9-11. Right after 9-11, uh, PBS uh, gathered a group of leaders from around the country, you know, from every walk of life. There were some senators there. Madeleine Albright was there. And somehow, because I, I had had my, uh, some involvement with the Promise Keepers back in the late 90s. You know, I was their national Asian American coordinator. So somehow, they wanted an Asian-American guy, they wanted a Christian guy, whatever. And so somehow my name got into that, and I got invited to this thing. It was at the Y River Conference Center in Maryland, not too far from Washington, D.C. I got to meet Madeleine Albright in person, you know, like, woo, you know, to actually shake her hand. But the thing is, uh, it was a two-night, three-day conference, all right? And at the last morning, as I was getting ready to leave, and, you know, there were hundreds of people there, somebody came up to me, and they looked at my name tag, and they said, Oh, uh, your, your name is Lewis, and you're with a group called Ministries for English-Speaking Americans? And I was mortified because I had failed to look at that name tag more carefully myself. The ministry is called Ministries for English-Speaking Asians. That's MESA. Ministries for English-Speaking Americans would be a pretty huge ministry, <laughs> Right? You know, yes, I minister to millions, hundreds of millions of people. That's me. That's my, well, I've never heard of you. <laughs> so it's like, and because I failed to look at, you know, in a mirror, whatever, just to reflect on what, what are people going to see when they see me? And that was the last thing that happened before I left. So that means the entire three days and two nights, Madeline Albright, whatever, you know, everybody's seeing my name tag, Ministries for English-Speaking Americans. Wow. Wow. This is somebody I want to get to know, man. This, is, this guy should be on my radar. Ministries for English-speaking Americans. Well, you know, and I, I'm sure we've all had somewhat embarrassing situations like that where because we did not look in a mirror more carefully and, or we did notice something and we didn't bother to change it, whatever, whatever it might be, it's like, man, 
you know, the Word of God is supposed to be a mirror, a spiritual mirror for us to see clearly. Because we all get a little fuzzy, you know. We all think, you know, we might be looking great uh, until we look more carefully in a mirror. Uh, and then it reveals to us. But, you know, just knowing and, and seeing uh, without doing is, is a major problem. It's just like the guy who's got the big mustard stand on his face. He looks in the mirror, sees it, and says, eh, who cares? Doesn't bother to wipe it off to deal with it. That's a real problem. And unfortunately, let's face it, as Christians, there, there are times like that. We come to church, we, you know, we read the Bible, we see all these things, and, and sometimes we don't respond appropriately. But when we take communion, it's a time not only to remember Jesus, a time to proclaim the gospel, but a time to personally examine what's going on in my walk with Jesus Christ right now. Uh, you know, don't look at everybody else. I mean, there's a lot of crazy stuff happening in our nation, and we could really get, lose focus very quickly. You know, but we can't change anybody else. We're not re responsible for anybody else. We're responsible for the person in the mirror. And, uh, you know, as the one who preaches and, and talks to other Christians about this stuff, that mirror needs to be really big for me. And so that when I'm preaching or teaching the Word of God, it's not like, all oh, you people out there need to do this and that, whatever's like, oh, no, you know, what about me? Because I'm going to be held to an even higher standard. Those of us who preach or teach the Word of God are held up to a higher standard, as it should be. You know, how in the world are we teaching or telling somebody else what they need to understand from God's Word if I'm not doing it myself? Now, again, nobody's perfect, but we're looking for consistency. We're looking for growth. And we're all trusting in Jesus Christ to help us. Now, again, communion, you know, it's all about the Word of God, right? There's the written Word of God, the Scripture, that's like a mirror to us. But it all comes back to, to, to the living Word, which is Jesus himself. And so both go hand in hand. You see, some, you hear some people sometimes, well-meaning Christians, say, oh, I'm all about Jesus. I don't care about the Bible. It's like, what, what are you talking about? Or I'm really about the Bible. You know, I study the Bible. I know the Bible. Do you, do you know Jesus? Do you have an intimate, ongoing, consistent relationship with the living Son of God? Because that happens. You see Christians on both extremes. It's the living and the written Word of God together. Okay? So, if somebody asks you later today, you know, what is that communion all about? What's this Lord's table thing? Hopefully you can, you know, think of at least three reasons from 1 Corinthians 11. It's a time to remember, a time to proclaim the gospel, a time of personal examination. Let's close in prayer. <coughs> Excuse me, in case anybody was worried, I have allergies, Okay. I was just tested this past week because I went to visit Charlene at ACC and they have a very thorough screening process there, which is excellent. And so I, I tested negative for COVID. All right, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Our Father God, how we're thankful for how you love us so much and you demonstrate your love by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Father, I, I, I'm also thankful that you know that every one of us struggles with spiritual amnesia, and we tend to forget. We tend to get distracted so easily. And so we're thankful that you've given us some tangible, physical symbols that help us remember in a significant way. And one of those is communion, the Lord's table. And I'm thankful that even now, uh, we can fulfill these purposes that you reveal to us in 1 Corinthians 11. <clears throat> we want to remember, <clears throat> and we want to proclaim the gospel, and we want to have a time of personal examination. And Father, I pray that uh, as we take communion, both as individuals as well as collectively as a family, whether it be a physical family or a church family, that we can honor and glorify you and fulfill these purposes that you have for communion. And so, Father, we, as we transition now into communion, we pray that you continue to work in our hearts, draw us closer to yourself, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.
We are transitioning now to communion, and uh, we want to make sure... Everyone has one of these little cups. If you don't have one of these little cups, could you please raise your hand and someone can bring you one? Anybody? Everybody's got one? Okay, super. Now don't start peeling off the layers yet. Uh, I hear some people. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of funny, isn't it? I don't know, that's human nature or whatever, but you know, you, you get something like this and you just start pulling on those little tabs. Um, and, you know, some of you have done this before, so I'm, I'm not concerned about that. But if this is your first time, then it's more important to listen carefully to the instructions so we don't spill the juice in these pews, okay? So uh, what, what I'd like us to do, though, is just uh, reflect a moment uh, as I read uh, the passage we just looked at again, uh, just to prepare us again for communion. <clears throat> but I like to read this every time we take communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then verse 28, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. And so I'm going to just pause for a word of prayer at this time, and um, if we can just have like 30 seconds of silent prayer where each of us can just ask God to search our hearts and our lives and uh, just to help uh, us to, um, to deal with any unconfessed sin in our lives and, and to bring that before him, uh, so that we can partake of the elements in a manner which would reflect uh, how much we understand and appreciate that Jesus died for our sin. Okay, so just um, take a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll lead us in just a moment. Okay, let's pray. Our Father God, we know that uh, living in our American culture, um, it can be a real struggle at times to have even just 30 seconds of silence. Uh, We heard some street noise in the background, but for a moment, uh, for us to be able to reflect and to focus on you and your greatness and your majesty and your awesomeness, your holiness, your love, your grace, all magnified through the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And so, Father, again, uh, just prepare our hearts, both individually and collectively, as we have this privilege of remembering in a very significant and powerful way all that Jesus has done for us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, if you could just peel off that top layer, which is a clear plastic layer, not the purple layer, but the clear plastic layer, That will um, allow us access to the little wafer. And we're going to partake of this together. So just take that in your fingers. And remember that this represents the body of Jesus Christ for us. Okay, let's partake together. Okay, if you could peel away that purple layer very carefully because now this will expose the juice and we don't want to spill that. And uh, for those of you watching later online, um, forgive me for still trying to get into this mode of remembering to pause and to have um, folks at home. You can just get your own piece of bread or a cup of juice and you can partake of communion with us right there at home. But if we, as we peel away that purple layer, it will reveal the juice. You don't have to pull it all the way off, just enough so that we can sip it together. 
And let's uh, remember that this juice represents the blood, which represents the life of Jesus who died for us. Okay, let's partake together. Okay, let's pray. Now let me just, we're transitioning to pastoral prayer, so um, actually, uh, let me just mention, as I mentioned briefly, our dear sister Charlene um, had uh, bladder cancer surgery this past week. Uh, things went very well, and uh, she um, was able to recover at, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm losing track of time. Was the surgery this past week or the week before? It was, Anybody remember? Before. It was the week before? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it was the week before, and then she was able to uh, recover at uh, ACC Nursing Home. And praise God, she was doing much better. I was able to see her on Thursday, and I was really kind of shocked because, uh, you know, and I was expecting her to be wheeled out in a wheelchair, and she came walking in on her own. And she said uh, she was actually being um, able to go home the next day. So she went home this past Friday and is recovering at home. Deeply appreciates our prayers and uh, our, our ongoing prayers for uh, any additional treatment that needs to be done. Um, just give wisdom to the doctors. And uh, again, she's very grateful for all of us praying. Okay, just join with me at this time as I remember a number of praises and prayer requests. <clears throat> okay, let's pray together. Our Father God, we're thankful for another um, opportunity to worship and the fellowship together, and especially with communion. And Father, um, I just praise you together as a church family for watching over our dear sister Charlene, who um, had successful bladder cancer surgery uh, a week and a half ago and, um, and was able to recover at uh, ACC Nursing Home, and that you're watching over her, and she's home now, and probably going to watch this online later and uh, just how thankful she is for our prayers and our thoughts and our concern. Uh, we do pray for wisdom for the doctors as they figure out uh, additional treatments and pray that we can trust you for complete healing and uh, recovery for Charlene. And we're thankful, Father, that uh, we can remember to pray for those who um, have different physical struggles and with loved ones especially, and we think of our sister Doreen and her mother who's un under hospice care. And we pray that uh, uh, you continue to keep her comfortable. Thank you that she does know you personally. Uh, thank you for uh, a great visit, a time of visiting with her former pastor. And uh, thank you, Father, for just the opportunity to pray for those who need your special comfort and encouragement because they have lost a loved one uh, very recently, and we think of May losing her father, for Carol, who lost her mother-in-law, and others in the church family. And we just, again, we pray and we're thankful for how often and how frequent the church family um, responds, not only in praying for one another, but reaching out with expressions of, of encouragement, whether it be a phone call or an email or a card or even a visit when it's appropriate. And so, Father, we're thankful for a church family that experiences new life in Christ, but shares um, experiences and shares your love uh, with others as we have opportunity. And so, Father, we're thankful for this morning of worship and fellowship. We give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> Let's all stand as we sing about his grace, which is his blessings on us. When we don't deserve it, his amazing, amazing grace. Gone. I 
standing for closing prayer and let me just uh, mention briefly because you know to me uh, humor is a real gift from God and when I saw Charlene at ACC on Thursday uh, she told me some funny stories about Mike <clears throat> from many years ago and perhaps that'll be shared later during that special memorial service that we have here but uh, also she shared something kind of funny one of her neighbors was watching uh, our services online and um uh, mentioned to Charlene, says, Pastor Lewis seems like he's really in a hurry to leave every Sunday after he does go. He practically runs out the... And so she had to explain to him that I stand at the front door and greet people. <laughs> but, but see, one of the things you're, you're going to miss if you just watch online, uh, you know, some things are not clear about why I run out of here after I, I do closing <laughs> prayer. Uh, it's not because I have somewhere to go. It's because I'm <laughs> greeting folks on their way out. Okay, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. <clears throat> Our Father God, how we're so thankful, again, for the new life that we experience in Christ, forgiveness of all of our sin, uh, a new life knowing the God who created the universe, uh, th experiencing your love and your grace and your holiness. And Father, thank you that we can share that love with others around us, and thankful that uh, even the gift of humor is something that is a blessing from you, uh, and Father, that we can enjoy that interaction with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so, Father, uh, dismiss us now with your blessing. Uh, we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. God, I've been set free. My God, my Savior.